Okay, so we've been talking about populations, when they evolve, when they don't evolve. We said horseshoe crabs haven't really evolved in... Years. Ever. Half a... No, they evolved at some point. Half a billion years, 400 million years. Yeah. They really haven't changed much. What factors is it really possible for a species to be in... What do we call that when they're not evolving? Equilibrium. Gene genetic equilibrium. Yeah. And what are the factors that kick them out? Well, we said one, two, three, we've, we're up to four. Wow. No, no mutations. No migrations. What's number three? Um, no, we're natural Well, no. Um, population has to be big. Um, no small populations. So. So we have to say no migrate, no mutation, no migration, no small population, random. no sexual, no selection of mates. So random mating. Name me a species that rates rates randomly. <sighs> mates randomly. What's the second one? Sorry. Migrations. Migrations. Number five, the final thing that can cause a population to evolve if it's present, and if it's not there, you can actually keep the population in genetic equilibrium. No natural selection. I mean, that's what we said is the mechanism of evolution, so obviously if that's happening, the population's gonna start to evolve. Okay, so natural selection is the mechanism of evolution. If natural selection is happening, clearly the population is evolving. What we want to look at is how natural selection pushes a population. To do that, we first have to remember what it is. What do you remember about natural selection? Everyone's a little different. There's natural variation in any population. These, this is one of the slides that you've got in partial notes. So everyone's different. Life is hard. Many die young. Those with some kind of edge survive. And if that edge is genetic or behavioral, they pass those genes on to their offspring. They can also teach their offspring those behaviors. Natural selection changes gene frequency. It changes distributions. And what we're going to look at is how it changes distribution because there are three ways that it changes distribution. Okay, so remember, we said that distributions, that's how we look at the, we look at a graph like this to look at the distribution of a trait in a population, and what we're saying is that natural selection changes that. So there are three ways natural selection changes that, and today we get to talk about, oh, this is so grim, giant babies, dead babies, and dead mamas. Oh. What? This sounds horrible. Well, it kind of is. Okay, this is, this is pretty boring. It's just words. So let's just talk about the vocabulary here. What does it mean, do not yell this out, talk to one another, to stabilize something? To steady it? To balance it? I like those. What does it mean to disrupt something? Again, talk to one another, don't yell it out. Disturb it, shake it up. What about directional? It makes you think of direction, makes you think of going in a direction. So these are the three different modes that we see in natural selection. When we look at a distribution in a population, and we look at a population in which evolution is um, changing the distribution, there are three sort of ways this can go. And the first one is stabilizing. This is big babies, tiny babies, and dead mamas. Ooh. Well, let's look at the baby parties. So, these are babies. Aw, guess what? You were all babies once. What? You were. This is where we start. Unless any of you are an alien life form who transported down here and absorbed a human shape, you started off as a tiny human, a baby. And here's the homework question I would have assigned you yesterday if I had been thinking. Ask someone who knows, if anybody knows, what was your birth weight? How much did you weigh? You know yours. Good. Some of you know yours. I was 6'9". You were 5 pounds. You were preemie, maybe. Tiny? Okay. So 
Um, anybody, so you think you were five pounds. Anybody here know for sure that they were five pounds or under? Anybody here know for sure that they were 10 pounds or over? Dang. Those are the ones to whom their mamas get medals after the whole thing is over. Um, so if we look at a distribution of human birth weight. <laughs> human birth weight. Well, you know, down here we might have like 0.5 pounds. An 8-ounce baby. I mean, do you understand that two pencils weigh about four ounces? So an eight-ounce baby, we're talking about the weight of, like, four pencils. That's, that's... And it can't be alive, right? Um, usually not terrible. for long. Usually not for long. That's not survivable. We're talking about an infant that is usually, if we're talking about a, a half-pound baby, we're talking about an infant that's so premature that they're really still a fetus, they're not capable of living outside the uterus. Um, on the other end, you know, maybe we have up here 20-pound baby. So somewhere here in the middle, we've got average birth weight. And this curve probably looks a lot like this. And it's a pretty sharp peak. What does that mean about what people weigh when they're born? About. So, not with numbers. Where do you see the most individuals in that curve? At the ends or in the middle? Middle. 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 And it's a sharp drop-off. It's a very sharp drop-off. So let's talk a little bit about what happens if you are a baby or a mama and you're not pretty close to the middle. So at the bottom end of that, low birth weight babies. Babies who I think they consider low birth weight five pounds and under. Um, and there are full-term babies who are low birth weight. Um, a lot of times if you've got a mother who smokes during pregnancy, that contributes to lower birth weights. So you can have very small babies. Um, very small babies have a host of medical issues. They are much more likely to die in their first year of life. They have, and, and this is, we're talking about full-term tiny babies, so not even preemies. Preemies have, my husband was a preemie. He was four weeks premature, um, and he had all kinds of issues in the first couple months of his life because of it. Um, we're not talking about preemies. We're talking about babies who are cooked a full 40 weeks. I say cooked because I think it's hilarious, but um, bun in the oven, baked, whatever. Um, babies who are full-term and tiny have got health issues. A lot of them don't live. If you don't live past the first year of life, are you going to pass on your genes? No. Now, on the other end of it, and this was in Indonesia actually in the last 10 years, that's an AP or AFP? Anyway. See, the don't understand. Well, so let's talk about this. Very, very, very large babies have also got, aside from any issues with delivery, which there are issues with delivery, very, very large babies are more likely to have metabolic issues. So very tiny babies very often have a lot of respiratory issues, and I'm not sure why, but very, very large babies often have issues with, with their metabolism, with getting nutrients where they need to go. Um, they also are more likely to die, but even if they, well, that's if they get out. Because here's the thing. <laughs> they got to come out. They got to come out. And the old metaphor about a bowling ball and a drinking straw isn't so far off. That's not completely right on. But that's a pretty big baby to come out of a birth canal. So 150 years ago. Now today, they can do a sonogram. And if you're carrying that baby, they know that couple weeks before your due date and they say <laughs> you're not pushing this thing out your vagina this thing is coming out surgically this thing is not coming out any other way and you get a c-section period prior to the ability to know what a baby weighed in advance prior to the ability to do a surgical delivery which is a cesarean section they cut through your belly they cut through your uterus they pull the baby out they sew you all back up Easy peasy. Prior to that, the baby would die and the mother might die. So I personally know someone, um, and she just died a few years ago. She was my aunt. 
in the 1950s. No, 62. He would have been born in 62, I think. 61. Anyway, late 50s, early 60s. Um, she had a baby. They did not have sonogram technology. Nobody knew how big the baby was. Um, they figured he was probably over 11 pounds, and he died in delivery because they had to break his collarbone, and they ended up breaking his neck in an attempt to get him out of her body. She already had two children at home. Her dying in delivery would have left two orphans. That's what big babies meant at one time in human history. Prior to the ability to assess fetal weight and do a surgical delivery if necessary. Now, had that pregnancy occurred in this decade, she would have had a C-section at 37 weeks, period. Typical, typical pregnancy is 40 weeks, so that's a preemie, but it's a, it would be a, probably a normal birth weight preemie. So what do you think? Do you think there's a genetic component to birth weight? Here's the homework question I have for you, since I forgot to ask you to go find out your birth weight if you can. If you are in contact with the human being out of whose body you came, and some people are, some people aren't, but if you happen to be in a position where you talk to your biological mother on a regular basis, ask her what her birth weight was, because you know what the single best indicator of fetal birth, of birth weight is? Mother's weight at birth. That is the single best indicator. <sighs> Females, should you ever become pregnant, you will start researching these things <laughs> because you kind of want to know, how big is this thing going to get? Um, <laughs> so single best indicator. I was 6 pounds 9 ounces. My daughter was 6 pounds 7. Two ounces off. There's a very strong evolutionary pressure for humans to be in that normal birth range. Six, seven, eight pound babies, not a problem. 11 pound babies, 14, 15 pound babies, 20 pound babies are probably not survivable for anyone. Um, now sometimes those very large birth weight babies are as a result of some other medical thing, um, but this is, it's really strong evolutionary pressure. You are way better off as a species if your birth weights are in this narrow range that works. So this is kind of a grim way to start, but the good news is, guess what? There are very few 11 pound babies because people who were 11 pound babies may or may not have lived to pass on their genes. Who survived preferentially to pass on their genes. People who were six, seven, and eight pound babies. This is what we call stabilizing selection. So in stabilizing selection, being average is good. Average is favored. It's selected for. The evolutionary pressure is towards being average. Being average is awesome. If we're talking birth weight, oh my God, you want to be average. Don't be exceptional. Don't be exceptionally small. Don't be exceptionally large. Just be average. So when we see stabilizing selection, what we see is that, because remember, evolution is changing, and there's no evidence that human birth weights are changing right now, though I suppose it's possible because we have the medical intervention to deliver larger babies and save them and their mamas. But I don't have any evidence on that. It would be a great project for someone. Um... When we see a population undergoing stabilizing selection, when we look at the initial curve, it's wider. And after we see that selection, it gets narrower. So the, the, the mode, the peak of the curve, tends to get higher. And it's, the spread tends to diminish. The extremes are not a good place to be in stabilizing selection. Something about being in one of those extremes will tend to kill you or prevent you from passing on your genes. Mode, the most common measurement, the average, is the sweet spot. These are some of Darwin's finches. 
Darwin, Charles Darwin, um, biologist who traveled on the USS or the HMS Beagle um, to the Galapagos and was one of the first scientists to write out a comprehens comprehensive theory of biological evolution. He wasn't the first person to have the idea, but he was the first person to get published with the idea. Um, one of the things he had observed was these birds. They got called Darwin's finches. The amazing thing is they all started out looking like that. Look at that beak. Well, some of them ended up with beaks that were much shorter, some with much longer. Some aren't all that different, but a little bit curved. Do you remember clip birds? So we had a real simple situation there where we had one species with a good bit of variation and on one side of the island one extreme worked better and on the other side of the island the other extreme worked better. So in disruptive selection being out here is good and being average kind of stinks. It'll get you killed. So if we look at the clip birds, there was no place where the medium birds were best adapted. I mean, they could muddle along. But in, in bo on both sides of the island, on one side being a short-beaked clip bird was the best thing, and on the other side being a long-billed clip bird was the best thing. In disruptive selection, these extremes get selected for and what we very often get is a two-humped camel. We get a bimodal distribution. So we end up, this can start to form two species sometimes. We can start to see um, species diverge. And we're going to talk um, about that with disruptive and directional selection. So disruptive selection shakes things up, splits things makes things very different. Well, they're peppered. Um, originally, so interestingly enough, peppered moths are a British species. Anybody here have a grandparent old enough to have worked in a steel mill in Weirton, Youngstown, Steubenville? Great grandparent? Uh, grandparent who remembers when the mills were all running. Okay. So, um, I, I'm old enough that I just barely remember, and for me it's Youngstown. Um, I don't remember the height of the mills, but when I was a really, really, really little kid, um, there were still mills that were operating. And, no, steel mills. Oh. Steel mills. So, um, the, the joke, a friend of mine who's a little older than me, says his mom always said, well, you never hang the wash out until Sunday, because on Sunday they don't run the blast furnace. Because when the mills were running full bore the rest of the week, there was this, like, black sooty powder that settled over everything. So if you hang your laundry on the line clean, when you come back out, it's covered in this soot. So you never hang the wash out. Everything was covered in soot. The houses were covered in, like, this little fine black powder, this soot. It's terrible. Um, this was the original peppered moth. So these were in London. You know, they would have been common in London. It's not that big, obviously. I mean, this is, it's about this big. But they're white with black spots, so they look like, you know, pepper. And some of them probably have a little bit more black, a little less white, and some have more white and less black. Natural variation. Salt and pepper. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, on one end of the spectrum we would have had moths that were entirely black, almost no white on their bodies. On the other end we would have had moths that were mostly white, almost entirely white, with no black on their bodies. And, you know, dead in the middle maybe we have moths that are about 50-50. And these are the worst moths I have ever drawn, just in case you were wondering. Yeah, they kind of do. So, you know, somewhere in the middle we have that. Now, in London in the 1700s, prior to the Industrial Revolution, no factories, clean air. Um, before, before widespread coal burning, this is the countryside surrounding London. We had a 
pretty even distribution of these things. Okay, and probably a little bit of a hump in the middle. There's no advantage um, to being one particular moth. Oh wait, there is. So you have birch trees, and birch trees are the white trees with the little bits of black on them. You've seen them, perhaps? Yes. Well, when you're a moth that's right about here on the spectrum, and you land on a birch tree, you're nearly invisible. Harder for predators to get you. Good. After the Industrial Revolution, after they started burning a lot more coal and a lot more factories, Everything, trees, houses, buildings, becomes covered in black soot. Which moth now has an advantage? Black. A moth that's about here. And so what we see is that over time, the most common coloration for peppered moths shifts. And this was one of the first studies done that really showed directional selection. In directional selection, the mode moves in one direction. And this is what was common among peppered moths after the Industrial Revolution. It's pretty significant. It's, it's fairly significant. So in directional selection, what we see is that either values at the large end or values at the small end are favored. So what we have is that the mode moves in a single direction. It can move up, it can move down. One extreme is bad, one extreme is good. And what you get is a new normal distribution with the mode being higher or lower than it was. So it doesn't give you a skew. It might for a little while. There might be a while where, you know, sort of you go from this to that, and then eventually things kind of settle down and you're there. So that's, that's sort of how that would progress over a number of generations. You usually, you do go through a period where you're probably skewed, um, but then as those larger values or smaller values become more common in the population, you start to see variation below that mode or above that mode. Okay, I'm going to pause. Your test tomorrow is only going to, it's going to be a, a full chapter quiz, but it's really only going to be over the five things that shake up equilibrium. So these kind of examples we've talked about, mutations and migrations and population size, genetic drift, um, along with mating selection patterns and natural selection patterns. There's another little chunk of the chapter, perhaps you noticed, talking about speciation and gradual versus punctuated equilibrium. We're going to cover that as a tiny little sort of mini unit when we get back. And we'll, we'll just talk about it for about a day, and then we'll do a recall quiz. And then we're going to move on, because the unit that we're going to start after break is a special unit on white tails, ticks, and Lyme disease, which is a kind of, it's kind of a cool unit for us to do, because a lot of people know people who've had Lyme, a lot of you spend time in the woods, and probably a lot of you have had ticks on your body. Um, so we're going to do that when we come back from break, and that's our introduction to ecology because this is where we will end up leaving evolution. So we will, we will stop at this slide in your notes. Everything before here is fair game. And then the, the last little chunk um, we're going to handle sort of differently, and you'll have a recall quiz when you get back. So we'll do like a day on that, and then we move into ecology. Questions, comments, concerns? I'm going to give you the rest of the time to work on vocab part C. You should be able to answer the rest of the study guides. Oh, get out your Skittles Island packets. Get out Skittles Island. That is the one other thing we should do. Uh, you want to in the I'll grade it. I don't want you to put it in the box because I don't. Okay. Who had a relatively normal distribution to start with? Anybody have a relatively normal distribution? What's a normal distribution? Bell curve. Bell curve. So, okay, you didn't necessarily have a normal distribution. I'm going to use your data because I like it. So, and then I'm going to I'm going to fudge some numbers. Can I take a picture of your data? 
wunderbar. This was a large population, right? Yeah. Okay. What is this? We did this while you weren't here. Yeah. Are the papers on Yes, they are. Okay, so here's her, her initial population, and we would probably call that a skewed distribution. Skewed that way. Okay. Now, I'm not even going to look at the rest of your data because I'm going to make up my own stuff here. Question. So if after the events that happened on her island, if her data started to look like that. So if we go from this distribution to this distribution, which pattern of distribution are we seeing? Are we seeing stabilizing, directional, or disruptive? Talk at your tables. Do not yell it out. What do you think? Every time you ask this question, what you have to say is, are, is only one extreme being selected for? Are both extremes being selected for? Or is the middle being selected for? So in this case, going from here to here, does it look like the middle is being selected for? No. No. So we know this is not normalizing. Does it look like one extreme is being favored? No. Does it look like both extremes are a good place to be? So this would be disruptive. We're having selection occurring. Selection is being favored on both ends of the spectrum. Okay? Okay, so here we have, this was a very small island population. We know that islands are more prone to evolution happening by accident. What do we call that? Genetic drift. Drift is just, you know, the random chance that, that uh, plays a part in changing gene frequencies, and if the population is small, that can actually cause evolution to happen. So we start off with more or less a normal distribution, and we end up with that, like no other colors. Now the mode was here, and the mode moved, you know, the mode was here, the mode moved that way. Was one end or the other selected for? This one's kind of tough. I would probably tend to call this directional selection. Our mode moved. Um, if somebody wanted to argue that it was um, stabilizing, we're not far that far off the original mode, but... A real stabilizing selection would look like this at the beginning, turning into maybe that. You know, so we we basically shrink; those extremes are gone, and we have more individuals that are more on average. Questions, comments, concerns. Do you feel like you can fully answer the questions on the back now? Yes, yes, okay. So the rest of the time is yours. Finish the questions on the back. When you're done with those, turn it in. Question. When you're done with those questions, you can turn it into the box. So you get the rest of the time to work on vocab part C, to work on um, study guides, and to work on finishing that. So that's three things. Tomorrow is your quiz. It is the one and only time I'm not going to hand you vocab well here's the deal I'll hand you the vocab here's what we're gonna do I'll hand you the vocab but when we get back we're still gonna do one day finishing up this stuff so yeah I'll hand you the vocab but um, it's not gonna be due the day we come back it'll be due a few days after we come back so that's that's what we got